So um, what I'm going to do today is, uh, is quite hands-on and practical. Um, I can talk for hours about the standard and how you would maybe implement that and uh, what the standard says in detail. But uh, the problem actually comes where things don't get, go so smoothly and where there's major gaps that exist in terms of, um, you know, keeping that implementation going and keeping all the people around you inspired and motivated to be part of it. And that's where often things go wrong. And it often actually starts, unfortunately, with the top. Uh, where the top actually says, yes, I'm very committed. Uh, I need to, uh, you know, be involved in this. And uh, and I really want risk management to, to work properly and those sorts of things. But the problem often uh, uh, exists where that verbal support from uh, the board and the executive doesn't get translated so much into actual doing. And um, I'll talk today a little bit about the actual doing and to keep your process, once you've implemented it, to keep it alive, to monitor it and to improve it over time. It's actually really important to have that uh, the top down engagement from, uh, from all the way from the top and also from all the people around you at the more operational levels. Um, risk resides everywhere in an organization potentially and without your eyes and ears being replicated through the rest of the organization as in you know the eyes and ears of everyone actually being your monitor and your ident risk identification mechanism um, and, and without all the staff around you being actually understanding of the fact that it's really important to help with this process um, you're actually going to miss out a lot I think in in terms of the success of, of risk management so I'll talk uh, a lot about uh, the potential pitfalls today and also some real opportunities of some real hands-on engagement of people around you and whether that's the top or whether it's the operational level um, yeah they need to be involved and if you're a risk manager or risk practitioner uh, or risk consultant you already know all these things how important is it but everybody else tends to be busy with their day-to-day -day work and the what-ifs you know, the, the risk management uh, people, they're often seen as, well, a little bit showstoppers and a little bit like, oh, they come up with all these what if scenarios, you know, the doomsday thinkers and, you know, they stop what I really want to do. And, and so that whole stigma um, prevents a lot of the success in terms of risk treatments, monitoring, improving and getting investments for, for risk management off the ground. So um, hopefully this resonates with a few people. By all means, please keep chatting in the chat about some of the thoughts that I'm sharing here, because what I'm sharing is just one direction. Uh, what you can share between yourselves, all um, dozens of you out there, you know, it's actually just as important. And uh, and let's see this, see this as a as an opportunity for you guys to share between yourselves just as much as well. And uh, that's interesting for me as well to read, you know, what, what goes on in your life in, uh, in risk management. So um, I've already been introduced quite uh, heavily. You heard a lot of ISO terms, ISO this, ISO that, 2301 and 31,000 and 27,001 and all those things. So I won't go through that detail, but I'll cover a few bits and pieces about my background here. Um, you can see that I, um, well, you can probably hear that I have a Dutch accent. Um, so I'm originally from Holland, from the Netherlands. Um, and, you know, the Netherlands is uh, 70 to 80 percent underwater level. And so the, the Dutch people from Holland, they, they are born, I guess, with the risk management uh, DNA, with the gens, with the genetics, because we, we manage risk, you know, we keep that country from flooding all day long. And um, it also taught me a lot, actually, about uh, preparedness and about um you know, people thinking, oh, for example, um, tsunami risk, you know, global warming and waters heightening. Oh, for Holland, that must be, for the Netherlands, must be a real, you know, serious threat and a serious problem to manage this. And my answer is actually to that, well, they've done this for decades, for decennia, maybe, you know, for, for hundreds of years. Um, so, yeah, it's when you get better at managing, you also are better at preparedness, you know? So people who are now suddenly dealing with flood risk for the first time, some countries that never had to think about it, they're much more challenged because they don't have the established protocols, the, the budgets, the government at local government level, state level, state government level, they don't have all those things embedded. So in that sense, I learned a lot from Holland as in how do you prepare? It's actually to really engage everybody, including the population, but also, you know, the different levels of government and business to manage a risk and so that was just a little anecdote there but um you can see a few other things in here um i absolutely love traveling i love doing this work everywhere 
Uh, I've been actually very surprised seeing the same kind of uh, issues arising everywhere. Uh, not so much the same risks. I mean, the risks are different in every country and every industry. But um, the problem is more the, the 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 way that people manage risk and the way that they, they deal with it in organizations tends to be fairly consistent and fairly consistently um, not always perfect. So, um, yeah, so I'll share a lot of, uh, of my experience from all the, the places that have done this work. You can see there Australasia, Africa, Europe, Latin America. Um, so I've, I've been uh, a lot in Asia this year again. And uh, yeah, also uh, I went to Lima actually to do some work there. There's a person here from Lima, South America. Um, I also went for the Australian government there and trained a whole bunch of small businesses uh, in, in Desi. It's called uh, a government body. So you can see if you're starting on the, on the journey of risk management, some of you may be starting on that. Um, you can quite uh, quickly build up, um, you know, some travel uh, miles and some uh, some profile for your CV because there's there's really a lack of skill in this field everywhere, uh, and especially especially in certain pockets of risk like cyber risk, for example. Of course, we're all struggling to get good staff there, and uh, and the young people are now without going to universities, jump into a boot camp and get, you know, um, within three months they become uh, highly qualified, you know, and people don't don't have to they feel they don't have to study anymore except for that sort of really hands on training. And so the whole world has changed a lot in terms of risk management. And, uh, and, and yeah, you can see here some of the other experiences I've had and also the, the ISO standards that, uh, that were mentioned earlier. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is the regulatory space when it comes to risk management. Uh, in Australia, that was very much kicked off because I live in Australia since 23 years. I forgot to mention that. Um, so in Australia, it was very much kicked off by the um, financial sector and especially the financial regulator in 2005 started to really look at banks and insurance companies whether they had good risk management and business continuity protocols and processes in place and so that sort of kick-started the whole risk management uh, industry in, in some ways so I've been part of that journey since about 2006 in in my own capacity with running my own consultancy firm uh, it's grown uh, from strength to strength um, I started very much local in in Sydney, Australia, and with it within a, a year or two, I was already traveling loads of different places because there is just so much to do in this field. And uh, and like I said, if you've got an interest in cultures, risk management culture is also one of the aspects. So dealing with different uh, different people there. So that's a little bit about my background. Now I already mentioned that I'm a very uh, accustomed to risk well when I started work living in Australia and working in Australia I started to deal with a lot of other risks suddenly and you can see here some of the really frightening things and that's really also about risk assessment you know what is the chance you're really going to run into a shark in the ocean for example you know you're doing your impact and your likelihood assessment very quickly and if the if the likelihood is very very small and the impact is humongous uh, you know, like a shark attack, um, you still might actually choose not to go into that ocean. And I know people who actually don't go more than a meter or two in there before because of that reason. But businesses do the same thing. You know, we look at how likely are certain events and if they happen, how big the impact is. And then one third level comes in, one third question, and that is, do we have the money or the resources or the actual alternate ways to then actually treat that risk? Are there any other options? Do we have any workarounds, for example? You know, and um, that's often forgotten because it's often like, oh, we we calculate all the the impacts and the likelihoods, and and then we'll have our our priorities clear, you know, to treat the risks. But we also have to think about: are there even uh, alternate uh, ways to to deal with things and how to treat risks? So, for example, I've done quite a lot of work in East Africa, and. Whilst I was there waving the flag to say, you know, we need to treat the risk of um, single point of failure when it comes to connectivity, data connectivity, for example, um, the people would stare at me sometimes going, yep, we know, but there is no other supplier for data, for example, you know, for, for that part of the city or that whole region, we just have one supplier. So um, good luck finding uh, dual supplier arrangements as a risk treatment option, you know, to prevent certain outages. And so you've got to think about that third factor a lot as well. Is there a budget, but also is there actually an alternate supplier, for example, or is there a treatment option against certain threats? Like, I don't know, how far do you go? You know, you treat against certain types of severe weather, for example, of course, you know, you try to do that. But do we treat against meteor tracks or, uh, you know, Godzilla uh, <laughs> trampling over the city? No, probably not, you know. So there's always that, that decision making to do. And we have to be realistic and also to stay in tune with how 
the board and the executive and the marketing people think we need to be really um, practical and realistic about things because otherwise we will lose their enthusiasm and their buy-in and their commitment to help us with this process because if they think oh you're just trying to you know plug every hole and treat every risk no matter what it costs or no matter how how bad the burden is of of maintaining the the treatment options you know the, the preventative controls for example you know if they are too much of a burden people find workarounds you know and and go and back doors for example you can you might treat a risk of um you know um intrusion on your systems well, what does that mean? Potentially that you have to have much longer passwords on the system, you know, for all the users in the in the company or all the staff, you know, um, and you might have to make it really complicated passwords. But we also now see that if you do that and you you hammer down those, you know, those really complicated uh, treatment options, those those controls, then people find different ways, which often means a yellow sticky note with the password under the keyboard. And so that's what you also get if you're trying to treat things too strictly. And so it's constantly a people uh, balancing act keeping people involved, included in the process and uh, and keep them engaged. So I can see here a few comments, uh, yeah, a, a few um, uh, ideas here of people already uh, sharing also where they're from and uh, I'm looking at the chat here. And so hopefully, uh, yeah, you find it quite uh, entertaining to hear from others in this field as well. And we can ha have a session at the end of the, of the webinar where we also share some thoughts. So that's my introductory part. You can uh, you can see a few things there. Um, this is a whole bunch of different organizations that I've worked with over the last uh, 16 or 17 years in this capacity. Before that, I was in a permanent role in a uh, rural bank, in a retail bank. And so we had a lot of regulation around risk and business continuity and all that sort of stuff. So I, I dealt with that quite a lot, but this is just a snapshot. Um, I really have worked with, with the small end of town, the SMEs, but also with the bigger corporates and very large government departments still doing so at the moment uh, and always uh, always trying to expand of course and especially expand my vision and my understanding of their of their business so we work with about six to eight consultants at any point in time all over the planet really um so yeah it's been uh, been a fantastic journey and those who are joining from the first time in risk management uh, even this work in this webinar uh, welcome to the uh, to the community of the risk management people and uh, hopefully you stay and you uh, you enjoy the journey as well so risk appetite, it's the, the statement itself, when we talk about risk appetite, is already paradoxic, right? Because we think risk and appetite, wouldn't we, wouldn't we want, want to reduce risk all the time, you know? Uh, why would we have appetite for risk? Well, you can see here the, the whole disambiguation uh, statement, you know, in simple terms, risk is the possibility of something bad happening. Risk involves uncertainty about the effects of implications of an activity with respect to something that humans value, such as health and well-being and wealth, property, etc., often focusing on the negative, undesirable consequences. And this is what you find in the places like Wikipedia. It's all about the bad things. Risk is one-sided. It's a possibility of something bad, you know, some threat happening. Now, as you may have um, understood, you know, from previous webinars, for example, yesterday, you know, you, you may have heard things like risk is actually the level of uncertainty on objectives. And uncertainty is not a bad thing. It's something that just lives with you, but, but possibly for very good reasons. So if you choose to... Um, to uh, accept a certain threat, you often do it because there is an upside, there's a positive, there's a profit to be made, or there's a market to be expanded into, or a new product to be launched. And any new product, new market, new innovation, it incorporates a positive, uh, you know, an opportunity. And we can make money out of it, for example, or we can threat part. So, yeah, it's um, often... Uh, very negatively, uh, very negatively tinted uh, by by things like you know Wikipedia or, or other uh, lists of, of, of you know definitions. Whereas risk is actually, uh, in my view, neutral until someone judges it. Yeah, that's the the right way that I would I would summarize that. You know, it's it's really a neutral thing. For example, a global financial crisis. You know, people think, oh, that's a terrible thing. But is it good for some people? And is it very good for those that small population of those people who benefit from it? Yeah, probably. Same with the pandemic. Yeah, it's a terrible thing, you know, for an individual human being maybe. But did some people make a lot of money and a lot of profit and a lot of benefit out of it? 
And even did we all get some benefits in, in return? You know, we're sitting here in a webinar with you know dozens of people. In the past, it would be hard to organize. People were not connected. You know, all parts of the planet, the back, you know, sort of the the the, the you know the rural area, for example, of a country. And now, yeah, a lot of investment has been made in that. We're now more connected and more easily and more smoothly. So yeah, so that's that's uh, the the way to look at risk. You know, it's very very neutral actually. And so it's a calculated risk that you take to say, do I actually want that upside, even if I have some bad aspects of it? And so risk management is a coordinated uh, set of activities or the coordinated activities to direct and control an organization with regard to risk. And as per the international standard for risk management, the, the ISO 31000 or 2018 version, you know, the risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And so it's a calculated risk. And I really like this picture because it shows, hey, for the cat, that mouse is an opportunity. And the cheese is even an opportunity indirectly for that cat because now the cat knows where the mouse will go because where there's cheese, there's mice. For the mouse, that cat is a major threat. But the cheese is an opportunity, you know. So, and 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 the and and the actual device is, of course, a threat as well. So, it's all about the filters. It's all about the angle. How do we look at risk? And what level of uncertainty are we accepting in our life, in as a business or as a person? And so, some people tell me, oh, you know, there's risk averse, you know, organizations, like a bank, for example, or. Um, you know, there's a risk, uh, you know, with risk, high risk appetite, maybe that is an organization like Google or Facebook, you know, or a startup or something, because they'll have a lot of risk appetite, you know. And my question is always, well, in what form? Yes, it's true that some of those smaller startups, maybe they accept more uncertainty and more ups and downs and more peaks and troughs. But do they also calculate and choose certain risks over other risks? And for example, as in uh, Facebook or, or Google, yes, you take innovation risk. You put out sometimes, you know, software that is not fully tested yet, for example, because you want to be the first to market because it's a bigger risk to be the last person to introduce a new software. But do you actually um, safeguard yourself from other risks? You know, and maybe you guys can also chat about this in the chat. But if I was Facebook or, or Google, I don't really want my systems to be down and I don't really want my users to be compromised in terms of their security. So as a organization, I invest heavily in my data centers, in my multiple alternate ways to, to keep my systems up and running, for example. I also heavily uh, invest maybe in the security, the personal data security of, uh, of my clients. And so if I compare that to the bank, which we said had low risk appetite, Yes, it's true in terms of maybe innovation or some banks, you know, they're really reluctant to be uh, in any form of compliance risk. But do they have risk appetite in their dealing room when they're doing investment, you know, related sort of activity? Well, they have more appetite for risk there. And even in the innovation part, they actually sometimes take quite a bit of risk there too by introducing new software, new online services for banking, etc. And do they take risk when it comes to new clients, giving people credit cards, giving people loans? Yeah, there's risk there too, you know? So whilst we always think, ah, through our filter, we can see an organization being uh, having high or low risk appetite, it's someone else's filter might say the opposite answer, you know? So that's why this, this game stays very interesting. And um, risk management in that sense, it's never going to be completely objective. A lot of people ask me that. They say, oh, if we do a lot of work, you know, we do a lot of research for every risk and we know all the ins and outs and the impacts and the likelihoods, we can make it very subjective, sorry, very objective. No, there's no subjectivity in there anymore. And my question is always, well, to what degree can you research the impacts, the likelihoods? At some stage, you stop, right? So you don't know the full picture anyway. So there's always a subjectivity to it. And when we fill in risk matrices, risk registers, and we score the risks, we rate them, you know, we rate them with one or two or three or four or six or whatever, you know, of course, there's a certain level of subjectivity in there as well, because the person who fills it in may not have all the knowledge from their colleague who sits next door, you know. And so there's always a subjectivity in there. And uh, yeah. For that reason, I'll tell you a little trick. For that reason, I've stopped rating things between one and five, but I now force people to fill in between one and four or one and six, because I want them to be 
clearly choosing a not in the middle response. Because if I do that, if they have a, a busy day or if they're not so interested in risk management, I get my risk ratings back all in the middle in somewhere in the three, right? So yeah, so that's that's just something that I've noticed. And, and once again, another aspect of risk management being such a human process, you know, it's really about people and engaging people, et cetera. Someone is agreeing with the, the picture uh, illustrations and so on. So hopefully you take some of those away as well, because, you know, especially if you're looking for buy-in and support from, from senior people in your organization who really need to understand the big picture here, my answer is use pictures. A picture can say a thousand words. Uh, the more uh, text you put on the overhead slides, on the sheets, you know, you're actually going to get people or at that top level, pass it down the line again to read and not for them to actually go through it. So please try to be really practical, use metaphors. You know, it's a, honestly, it's a, for the, the higher up the line, the, the, the smaller the level of um, words, black text on white paper I, uh, I produce, you know, it's always more about pictures and metaphors and stories. So, so hopefully you enjoy uh, that part, of this part here as well. So categories of risk, you know, I always um, find various different uh, definitions for that, different, different groupings. But what I typically use these days is something around this, uh, along these lines. So the four categories that I often use are strategic risks, such as, for example, those related to mergers and acquisitions, digital transformation of an organization, like what direction are we developing in certain products or services they're going to think about for the future, you know, competitive position, their market share, globalization, industry changes. That's the kind of strategic risks we're talking about, the big picture. It's not per department or per activity in the business it's actually more the the, the, the overall uh, picture of it and then we have financial risks that can include, include things like market risk credit risk it can have um, liquidity risk interest rate risk exchange rate risk inflation investment risk etc um, I, I can also see uh, lovely that raising uh, their hand um, Maybe we can give that person the word to ask a question. If there's a question in between, I'm, I'm, I have no issue with that at all. I've got no problem. If you want to, uh, to ask a question there. Maybe it was just a wave. <laughs> if it was just a wave, that's fine. Uh, if you guys do have questions, then it's uh, please allow to unmute myself. Um, I'll leave it up, up to uh, Interenna. Did you want um, the questions to come through throughout the session? And is that technically possible that people are unmuted? Or would you say that's only uh, possible at the end? I'm happy to answer questions now. So, We might see that uh, coming through in a, in a little while. I'll just finish this slide and see if, uh, if Interland and the, the rest of the team can see if that's possible and if that's allowed. So just uh, let's keep going for this slide. Sorry about that, uh, Ladri. Um, So yeah, that was a financial risk, operational risks. There are often things like related to IT services, staff, productivity, physical assets, outsourcing and upstream, downstream supplier relationships and especially um, keeping the current operations going. So not so much about innovation and new things and strategic things. And, you know, it's, it's more about keeping the current business going. So what could disrupt that? That's what we typically see as operational risks. So we often see um, things like business continuity as one of the controls for operational risk, you know, so to actually have a business continuity plan in place, for example. And then the last one there is compliance risks. So that is, for example, those related to contractual obligations, for example, environmental, workplace health and safety, occupational health and safety, ethics, privacy related regulations. So it really about the regulatory space and also contractual obligations with customers or suppliers, for example. So that, those four categories I use a lot. Um, they're definitely not fixed. Um, it doesn't have to be exactly like this. Some people sp split out certain operational or strategic or financial risks or compliance risks. You know, they actually, uh, it's, it's very flexible. It's not, uh, it's not a mu must do this way kind of thing. I haven't uh, heard anything so far. Um, so I'm not sure if I can do that. Let me see if I can unmute you. No, I'm not able to do that. Um, it may be how they've set it up um, that we do the questions at the end. Would that be okay? 
Please, please keep typing, typing in the chat. All right. Um, all right. So what I wanted to mention here is whilst any of the above can also result in reputational risk, we typically see those covered under strategic risk. So reputational risk is actually a flow on and knock on effect of any other risk, because if any of these things happen, you've got a financial uh, risk of eventuating or operational risks or compliance or strategic, we tend to get, um, you know, possible reputational risk. So people talking about the brand, the reputation, you know, the longer term impacts. Yeah. So um, one question here is from um, the same person. Uh, risk calculation in financial terms is covered in this presentation. Not really, no. Financial risk as a specific topic, it's covered usually more in the banking uh, standards, et cetera, and in the banking protocols and, and practices, I would say, or, or not just banking, but general financial uh, industry. So the ISO 31000 is really an enterprise risk management standard and it's more end-to-end -end. so we look we talk more about all the risks together not so, much, not so much about calculating each of those specific financial risks but more a relative rating i would say so i hope that answers your question for this particular approach i think that's uh, as far as we normally go i haven't seen that done any more deeply uh, only in for example in a finance department all these different um, thresholds for credit risk, for liquidity risk, you know, those things are calculated very uh, regularly and very deeply. So that's in, in the context of enterprise risk management, we tend to stop at a certain point. Um, all risk at the end are converted to money. That's a very interesting statement. Uh, and thank you for being so interactive, Ladrina, uh, Ladrirat. Um, I wanted to, uh, yeah, to thank you for that because, yeah, it's true. And reputation is actually also sometimes transferred or translatable into money so there's a bit of discussion going on on the chat i'll let that naturally evolve um you know because it depends a little bit on whether you're a government department for example if you're a work for a ministry reputational risk doesn't necessarily translate to financial risk but financial risk becoming a problem let's say there's a, a company very much in the bad books when it comes to financial situation can result in reputational risk you know, and so that's uh, more the direction of thinking here. These four can create, uh, as a knock-on effect, reputational impacts, you know, reputational risk. And not so much the other way around. It's not like, ah, we've got a reputational risk. People are chatting on Facebook or LinkedIn about our brand. And suddenly we have any of these four. And we have for now, consider life, health, et cetera. That's covered usually in my world under operational risk. So you can see here... Um, Operational risks include things like those related to IT services, staff and productivity, physical assets, etc. So staff and productivity do uh, touch on that people factor that you just mentioned there in the, in the chat, uh, but also compliance risks. So workplace health and safety, ethics, privacy related, that's also a lot, a lot about people and their health and well-being, you know, and whether it's staff or, you know, customers, etc. So uh, people as a uh, factor that could be under a certain threat is intertwined with uh, with at least two of these and possibly more you know all right um let me continue on a little bit more um so these are some examples you know of uh of risks as you can see here and that includes uh the, the type of risk that we find touching on almost every category and that is our cyber risk and ransomware and things like that so cyber security risk really is in the realm of strategic risk also in the realm of compliance risk often, also creates very quickly financial impact. So the financial risk side of it is, is, uh, is in, included in that. And operational risk, for example, if your systems are frozen by a ransomware attack, then you'd have an operational risk as well. And again, as a knock-on effect, the reputation is probably at stake. So I've highlighted one particular risk, and that is the ransomware slash cybersecurity risk. And you can see certain risks fitting it really in the previous slide in all categories. Yeah, because the knock-on effects or the intertwinedness of some of those risks is very strong, and it can be really knocking over into another type of risk. You can see here some examples. For example, ran uh, ransomware victims paying ransom. You see that actually a lot of people, uh, a lot of companies say that they won't pay the ransom, but in the end, when they get attacked, suddenly there's a decision made that they will. And you can see how big that uh, percentage is there. And then you can uh, see here some uh, repercussions of data breaches. 
over the last several years, you know, and it's been going up and up and up in terms of costs of breaches, you know, so the financial impact is clearly there. And we already know that if there's a financial impact, that could be a reputational, you know, brand impact. Okay, then we have government considering uh, making company, company directors personally liable for cyber attacks. That's a new development in, in the Australian region, actually. Um, and so when we see this, then cyber risk is suddenly also a compliance risk. You know, if you haven't complied with something as a government, as a company director, then, you know, then you, are, you potentially could be personally liable. Then we see the financial impacts once again, you know, and also the ongoing, the supply chain impacts, you know, the JBS foods the, and the, the, the whole industry that uh, is involved in meat manufacturing that was hacked so badly, you know, you see some of those, uh, those impacts were really high financial impacts, but also supply chain related. And then here is one that is the silver lining, as I call it. One company was hit by, with a devastating ransomware attack, but instead of giving in, it rebuilt everything. So basically they said, we're not paying the ransom. And we see this as an opportunity, actually rebuild our entire systems from fresh, from old backups. We actually got think tanks happening, staff got together to fill in the blanks, all the, the data that they did actually lose. And they said, we're not giving in, basically. And they saw it as a kind of an opportunity. So I would say that uh, the silver lining kind of examples that we could take, you know. So, all right, let me um, continue on. Um, earlier, those people with questions, yeah, please keep putting them in the chat. I think technically that's probably a better idea. And I'll keep uh, looking at the chat from time to time. And at the end, of course, we have a solid, uh, uh, you know, at least 15 minutes for, for question and answer. So um, that's also absolutely fine to save them for that moment. So this is a little bit of an example of the risk management process. Now, there's different ways to map this out. But as you can see here, what we often see is in, initially we need to at least communicate and consult with certain interested parties, some uh, external parties or even internal parties that actually feed information into our risk management process so that we can actually cross-check whether we're on the right scope, if we have the right context, do we set the right criteria and all of that, you know, are we actually implementing the right treatments, are they working, you know, all of that is actually related to that communication and consultation process on the left-hand side there. On the right-hand side, on the other end, once we've actually implemented risk management as a process, we want to monitor and review and cross-check with people and cross-check with those regulators and other people that gave input initially, but also generally actually keep monitoring, you know, how we're tracking with our risks. Are we actually getting benefit from the treatment options, from the risk treatments, the controls that we put in place and that we spend so much time and, uh, and potentially money on? So that's the two pillars on the left and the right here, as you can see. Now, in the middle, you see the actual risk management process and especially that risk assessment piece. Um, maybe you heard some information about that yesterday as well in the other webinar. Um, risk identification is the first step. Then we have risk analysis and then risk evaluation. And risk identification is really an outward process. You're really looking at anything that could happen to the organization. It's a creative brainstorm style process in my uh, world, how I normally um, conduct that process. And what's important that you then actually really engage the top, the bottom, the left, the right, the center of the organization, because otherwise you won't actually understand what risks are there. I'll, I'll give you a very practical example. Um, I know only from talking to, for example, physical security guards, you know, who work in the operational areas, they actually know where the biggest risk, the biggest likelihood resides, for example, of a particular security threat happening or a, a burglary, you know, or what do you call it, a break in into the building or something, you know. Um, and so they know that because they know where they have certain times when they're maybe low on the ground, like every week, maybe at three o'clock, one of them is picking up their child from school and the other one is having a, I don't know, a coffee break or something, you know, they work in that process and therefore they are the best eyes and ears for any particular uh, loopholes, threats, you know, that could happen. The same happens with, for example, financial areas, finance areas, they know when or how certain human errors are made on the system. They know how hard it maybe is to train new staff and how long it takes for an untrained staff to be fully trained. 
and what sort of errors that person can make. They understand that risk because they observe it. They actually work in that area. And what's, what I said earlier, again, is those risk registers that people make, you know, that they fill in from a little risk management office or something, you know, it's actually it really needs to be engaged with all those people who actually work out there in the organization and don't try to... Um, yeah, try to, to do that job because it is their job actually. And it may be a very small job that they all feed in, but that makes the actual process alive and makes it realistic. So that's risk identification there. Then risk analysis is all about calculating the impact and the likelihood. Then we risk evaluate by actually combining the, the impact and likelihood ratings and we prioritize our risks. And then we get to what this topic in this session is also all about is the risk treatment. So we then choose certain treatment options, which I'll show in a minute, you know, how you can actually then um, do something about that particular risk. Now, you will do something about that risk to a certain degree that it's also valid in terms of time and money and um, effort. And also what we need to do is then compare that to our risk acceptance criteria. And we saw them at the top there, right? But we need to cross-check, monitor, and review. And you can see that here, you know, when you have your risk treatments, you monitor, you review, you cross-check with your risk analysis if that, that was actually true. You also look at the, the scope, the context, and criteria. Does it all fit the bill? So you're cross-checking all the time, basically, with, with those items if you're doing a good job. And with um, setting the right risk acceptance criteria, I'll delve into that world quite a bit um, in the next couple of slides because... That's what I see as a, a serious gap uh, where the, the operational level and the risk management department, they're kind of flying blind as to what is acceptable in terms of certain levels of risk and what is actually okay to accept. And who determines that? Well, guess what? The top management. Yeah, And if you don't have that dialogue, if you don't bridge that gap, if you don't bridge the gap between their culture and yours, but also their understanding of the concept of risk management, you've got to bridge that gap because otherwise you, there's a major uh, disconnect and they will just tell you, fix the problem or zero harm, you know, no risk allowed, you know, reduce the risk to zero. Whereas you're running around as a risk practitioner to try to do that and you know it already probably won't work anyway because there are certain risks that are too expensive or too difficult or impossible to actually close, you know, the, the gap for and so um, what happens typically then if, if those controls from the top are dictated too strongly, as in, you know, what's the, what's the acceptable level of risk? If that is too low, then what the rest of the organization tends to do is either just throw their hands in the air, go, well, I'll do best effort anyway. You know, um, it's not measurable enough anyway, so we'll just do our best and we'll see where it's, where, you know, where it ends up. And so, um, yeah, it's it's not really a, a good way to go about it. And that's what we'll talk about in the, in the next section as well, is to actually, when you're doing your risk treatments and you check, is it good enough? How well are we tracking? How do you make that decision whether it is good enough? And so once we've done all that, we do some recording, reporting, and of course, monitoring and review fits in there as well. Now, I already mentioned the risk assess assessment step there and whether it is satisfactory or not. If it is, yes, we continue on to our treatments. If not, we go back up. So we're talking here about the point from risk assessment to risk acceptance. From the top to the bottom here, risk assessment to risk acceptance. Let's go back to our previous slide. That's risk assessment, this whole block here, to risk acceptance. Yeah, and that was our our step where we basically say is it good enough you know and so that sits in that risk treatment and then monitoring and review uh, option or, or step so it's basically going through these gray steps the, the one in the block that's what we do in this detailed map here on the next slide and as, what you can see here is that those risk those tr uh, treatment options have a number of forms and for example you have in this bar here you see risk modification risk retention risk avoidance risk sharing, yeah, and that's um, a couple of different notes to that is risk modification is changing the likelihood or the impact. Risk retention is keeping it as it is at the moment, don't change anything. Risk avoidance is the absolute hardest one that is like actually stopping a certain business activity so that you don't have that particular risk anymore. 
it's a very difficult thing to do because it will immediately impact on profits, on opportunity. You'll get quite a lot of resistance from other people in the organization, like marketing or sales or whatever, you know, who want to innovate and want to bring new uh, products to the market, which means risk. You know, so risk avoidance is probably the the less the least likely one that you will choose. If if you can avoid it, that would be good. Um, if you can avoid the risk avoidance, I mean, <laughs> risk sharing, there's two different um, notes to that. And that is outsourcing and um, insurance. So outsourcing is where you share the actual um, responsibility for that process with another party. For example, you outsource part of your IT to another party to do the backups and to do the, the ongoing maintenance of IT. Or it could be... Um, sharing the financial impact so that would be the insurance strategy where you say we we get insurance for something it won't help us to actually respond to the problem but it will help in terms of our financial capability and only one particular insurance i know that helps you actually continue your business and that is business interruption insurance business interruption insurance and that actually pays out immediately so you can continue buying product, selling product, you know, uh, purchasing raw materials, keeping on going with your business, paying your staff and all that. Yeah, so that's uh, that's business interruption insurance. Other insurances typically pay out later, so they don't help you live through the disaster. They help you later on recover your financial impacts, but not necessarily all the other types of impact. So these are the four types of uh, treatments that we normally see. Um, then you can see a risk treatment plan, so some sort of project plan almost to say, how do we implement all of this? And then there's residual risks, the outstanding ones, the ones that you cannot uh, or choose not to treat. And so that is a choice. You have to say, is that acceptable or is it not acceptable? And that acceptability depends on what objectives you set in the beginning. Yeah, so this little box, these two boxes together, the residual risks to the risk acceptance, the yes, no moments, you know, acceptable risk, all of that sits in this previous slide in that kind of the risk treatments compared to the risk criteria yeah, at the top. So it's just a different visual interpretation of very similar concepts. And this one is the zoomed in part of that uh, previous black, uh, blue, no, what is it, gray box that you saw on the on previous slide. Now, this all sounds, again, uh, very wonderful. It sounds very uh, organized and very uh, mathematical almost. But, you know, especially when you choose your options and so on, and you, you, you choose, you know, what is the priorities of all the different risks. But once again, you need to have the options to do it. Often the top left here, the flying blind of not actually knowing what risks are out there, especially in security, like cybersecurity. Um, I've asked many people who work in that field and said, with unlimited budget, can you reduce our cyber risk for our organization to zero? Can you really implement the right controls so that we don't have any risk left? And all of them say, no way, no way, not even close to that. They would not, with even with unlimited budget, they, they would not take the job on if it was on the basis of really having removed a lot of risk. And so it's like flying blind, you know? So even if we have all these prioritizations on the previous map where we say, oh, we must do this and these strategies, and have we assessed all the risks? What are the top priorities? Okay, we're going to treat all of them. We've got some budget. Even then, there's certain ones where you actually don't have enough information to even know what you have to treat and to what degree and how. Then we have this. And um, syndrome, invisible parts in front of us, you know, and not actually able to calculate um, all the. Um, the parts of the risk. Um, yeah, if we if we don't have, uh, thank you for that comment. Um, if we don't have all the parts of the risk visible to us, so we're still, it's similar to the flying blind situation, but in this case, we know there's risk. We just don't know how big it is, you know, and, and that can actually, in risk, it can flip very quickly. In an iceberg, it doesn't flip so quickly, but in, in real risk, you know, that we deal with, you know, whether it's financial or cyber, or operational risk, those things can flip very quickly. Compliance risk as well. You know, for example, GDPR was rolled out to the world as a compliance requirement. Overnight, we had all this massive, you know, uh, tip of the iceberg 
versus the bottom of the iceberg kind of research to do in organizations trying to really manage that risk, not even knowing how big it was and where it resided. So that's the second picture there. The third picture is, do we have the money? You know, what is the actual investment required? Is it a wise investment? Do we actually save ourselves sufficiently, you know, an amount of money if the risk were to eventuate and become a real situation? Does it then cost more money than what we now invest in our controls? Yeah, so that's also really important to, to realize here. And of course, the risk of human error, people pressing the wrong button, doing the wrong thing. Cyber is a real good example. I'm not sticking just with the cyber example, but it's just a good one because it's got so much uncertainty. And it, um, it really is now clear that something like 70, 75% of all the cyber attacks dependent on the, depended on a person clicking. Yeah, so it's not just some bad guy on, you know, bringing down networks. It, it's actually, yes, they do that. They, they bring bad things into your organization, but then still it often relies on a person. It depends on a person clicking. So, yeah, that's an, an important thing, so real thing to realize. Right. So uh, the risks within risk management. Now, that sounds very intriguing, right? What I'm trying to say here is how I see the biggest risk of risk management is actually how people are managing the whole process, producing quantity rather than quality, large volumes of data, you know, risk registered with, with 25 columns and 55 spreadsheets included in a workbook and large volumes of data, actually, including ratings held in big spreadsheets and software tools, but actually not really having enough insight what the the key risks are, you know, you see some reds and some yellow coding and some green coding, but the top, for example, the top management actually having to make sense of all those hundreds of spreadsheets or dozens of spreadsheets and all the different ratings in there, it's often a, a really unclear situation. So that's one of the risks of the process itself. Another one is the maintenance of these uh, things becoming a burden, needing them to be carried out by non-subject matter experts, for example, a centralized risk function, maintaining a risk register. Whereas really, as a risk practitioner, you don't really know, you don't really understand all the actual risks, the actual impacts, the controls, you know, the probabilities, because you don't work in those areas. Yeah, so that's an, another um, uh, real risk to the whole process. The third one I'd like to highlight here is treatment options or procedures to reduce impact are often not easily extractable. For example, all controls are bundled together in a risk tool. I don't know which of you guys are using risk management tools, but what I often see in there, one big bucket of controls, listings of, you know, people can put in all the controls they have, but it doesn't actually uh, really identify what are the post-incident controls when an incident happens. And that's often procedures, response procedures, you know, like, for example, if it was a, um, a power failure, it might be how to refuel your generator. Uh, if it's a financial risk that happens, how to quickly talk to the bank. And those sorts of uh, impact reducing controls, you really want accessible and available, even on a smartphone or standing on, you know, on the street, evacuated, whatever. You want to have access to those uh, items and they're often not easily identifiable in your risk management tools because they don't have a facility for that. And people don't tend to split them. The people, people put them all in one bucket, even if the tool has a, a function for it. And then uh, the last one here is top-down risk appetite and risk capacity are often unclear. So the flying blind situation, uh, the risk of over and under investing in treatments because the top has not really articulated what is acceptable, what level of risk can we actually tolerate, what is our risk appetite versus what we can handle as a business before we really go down. And so the, what we can handle, the, the worst case sort of thing that we can still just handle, we call that risk capacity normally. And I also bring risk tolerance in that space, but that's more the individual risks, whereas risk capacity is a bigger, bigger statement. It's all about what we can just handle, the stretch level. The, on the other hand, the risk appetite is what we say, this is the kind of, yes, it's risk, but it's the warm and fuzzy area. We can still really continue our business. We don't have a major threat going on here to our operations. And so the survival of our business is not challenged by that level. And the bandwidth in between, the band or the, the buffer in between is what we can move in to sort of yellow zone, as you probably would have seen in risk registers, what we say, okay, we need to improve this. We've got some time to do it. 
we, we may actually decide not to if it's too expensive, but it's a manageable risk. That's that yellow zone. You know, it's not ideal, but it's not a major problem. The red zone is where we go beyond the risk capacity. And the green zone is where we're under that risk appetite. And this is applicable to all the negative risks. I'm, now I'm talking about the different levels, right? Risk appetite is low for negative, you know, for threats, for negative risk. If it's an opportunity and you describe the risk in a positive way, like a merger or acquisition can be described as a very positive thing, right? Like innovation, but it also has the negative threat attached to it. So if I say, um, you know, the number of innovations, I often talk about risk appetite being higher than our risk capacity. So I might say the risk capacity is that we introduce at least one innovation a year to the market, but our risk appetite is three. So with the positive type of risk, with the opportunity side, we actually have risk appetite higher than risk capacity. With the negative risks, we, it swaps. Yeah, hopefully that's clear to everyone, but this is something you can play with, you know. I don't want you to go into too much, uh, you know, detail about this right now, but if, if you're working on this later on, this is how you do it. Then we have uh, the typical risk appetite statements that I see out there in the world. And this is not what I think are the perfect risk appetite statements. I'll show you two or three examples of things and you might recognize some. The first one, we're basically saying our approach to risk is that we're averse or we're cautious or it's a moderate risk or we are enterprising. We pursue options that are ambitious and it's not reckless, but we continue on. You know, we have maybe higher business rewards. So it's where we actually seek the risk. The pink area on the left, the averse, is where we avoid that risk. And there's a few things in between. But the description of that is all in words, you know, and it's all very um, interpretable. It's related to what, what the reader might think, what the reader might have as context. It's not... Um, it's not easy to quantify this or to actually say, yes, we've done a good job or no, we haven't done a good job. So the subcategories you can see there are things like maximizing growth opportunities, developing innovative products. You know, we might say we have an enterprising level of risk there. Whereas a subcategory like health, safety and well-being, we have an averse level of risk. You know, so this makes some sense. It gives some context, but the description is fairly yeah, interpretable. It's not... It's not ratings, it's not percentages, it's not, you know, um, euros or dollars or something. It's it's very descriptive, you know, and it's not a, yeah, it's, it's not something you can quantify very easily. All right, um, the next slide shows some other examples. This kind of statement I see in a lot of risk appetite uh, documents. We are working towards a, pos a position whereby we are not jeopardized by short-term revenue and cost fluctuations. That's not so bad. It's a pretty good statement, you know, but it's still, what is short term? What is uh, fluctuations? How big are those fluctuations? What can we handle? 5%, 10%? Is that over a year? Is that over a month? Is that, you know, what time of the year or month or week or, or day? The next one is saying, we, say, we aim to seek opportunities to provide us with sustainable growth, providing that it is in accordance with our shareholders' objectives and goals. So that's also a pretty good statement to say, we seek innovations, opportunities, uh, for sustainability, but it needs to be within reason, basically. Again, it could be a little bit interpretable. You know, it's not uh, very mathematical, but it's it's uh, everybody can at least see what that means. We will protect partnerships with key long-term suppliers as a high priority. So this is another one, you know, where we say, okay, uh, only the key long-term suppliers, not all the other ones. So there's at least some prioritization happening in here. We will protect our brand and do not have appetite for negative public comment, nor in traditional or social media, or on, on our products, nor on our staff, nor services. So this is where we say we don't have risk appetite at all for negative public comments. And it could be for staff, services, products, whatever. Okay, we don't have any appetite. This, for, in my world, needs to be first assessed and checked against what is really happening right now. If there is now regularly some negative comment in the news every year or maybe every month or every week about your brand, your appetite, it should be realistic. You know, it should be measurable. It should be smart, attainable, you know, time bound. It should be something that is actually achievable. If the zero negative public comment, uh, nor in traditional, not in traditional social media, if that is the 
uh, the the appetite. You know, we're actually basically saying any time it happens, we're breaking already what we we promised ourselves. Now, if there's quite regularly a bit of negative comment happening, we need to make risk appetite statements that are actually uh, leaning towards that or that are saying, okay, over time, maybe we reduce it by 10, 20, 30 percent you know, of the frequency of that public uh, negative comment. But you can't just go from having a weekly negative comment to zero, because if that's the target, which is what this says, you know, the staff will just go, well, really, how do we get there? It seems like an unclimbable mountain you know like mount everest time three you know and so that's not what you want and so that's why these statements often don't they give some sort of context but they're actually not measurable and therefore they confuse people more we can absorb some variances in the quality of products and services in the short term but must be in a position to deliver reliable and consistent quality of products and services in the long term once again my problem with this is is it long term short term you know what does that actually equate to is it you know, can it be quantified to a certain degree so that people can measure has this been achieved or not? And not just with another uh, vague statement. Right. So um, we, the final question then is we will look after and protect staff as a high priority. You know, that is often put as a final point now that's a bad idea if you want to get staff on board for this whole process you want to make sure that they know they're protected by this process as well and that they're actually the prime priority because all these other things you know getting partnerships you know protecting the brand you can't do without staff actually being around and being uh, engaged in your, in your business so i would probably say make that always the first one regardless you know something about uh, protecting staff and looking after them etc so so that's uh, important you know that we get the priorities clear um, we've just looked at the time. Um, I think we'll probably end up going for another 20 minutes or so. If you're interested in this topic, please stick around. We're going to talk about risk appetite uh, and uh, risk capacity in a minute. So this is another typical risk appetite that I see. You know, it could be risk categories, you know, like corporate social responsibility, for example. The risk appetite statement is what I found with some organizations that I worked with. It's things like this. We have a close interface with the community. We support the prosperity of the region. We balance the position of priorities. We strive to be caring for the community underpinned by values of goodwill and respect. So I'm just reading out something from the second one there. And moderate to high risk appetite to deliver sustainable outcomes for the communities. I think these things are not measurable. I'm sorry, but it, it sounds like beautiful statements, vision statements, but not like a risk appetite statement to me that is measurable by the next level down in the organization to say, okay, are we doing enough? Where's the threshold? You know, where's the limit? So that's important once again. Yeah, so there are lengthy in this particular one. I'm just showing you two different line items, but there's at least two, at least two lengthy items out of a seven page table so basically we thought we saw this table being seven pages with one organization you know and that's too much it's it's just very hard to extract the, the actual key information okay so what i think works better i already verbalized it earlier risk capacity being the stretch level and risk appetite being the level that is really comfortable within that gray area inside the gray area for your positive for your negative risk you want to be in that gray area to have it lower than your risk capacity and you want to have that sort of bandwidth you know the buffer as we call it so that's what i think is the best way to approach this work okay now one question for all of you yeah those who are out there uh, typing away or listening um, what i wanted to ask you always why does a car have brakes why does a car have brakes? So I'm going to stop for a moment with my talking. I'd like you to fill in there in the chat. Why does a car have brakes? Preventative risk assessment, emergency stop. Reduce the risk, reduce speed. Reduce accidents. Stop the bad stuff, right? Thank you guys for, for responding so quickly. Now, if I really wanna give the right answer here, what I would say is, so I can go faster. The car has brakes so that we can all go faster. Now think of yourself 
as the brakes for the organization. If you're talking to the board or the executive or the marketing people, and they're looking at you as you're a showstopper, you're stopping, you're reducing our speed, you're controlling us, you're reducing our risk, you know, that doesn't actually mean that they want to hear what you've got to say, because what they want to say is we want want to go faster we want to actually innovate we want to make more products we want to get more clients we want to you know use different suppliers we want to actually get a bigger supply chain that's all creating risk right you guys are here to have the foot on the brake so they can go faster now think about this as a real fundamental way of thinking about this problem yeah because if you don't get people along to your style of thinking this is usually what's behind it they see you as a showstopper yeah yeah so that's the idea of this yeah and hopefully this all resonates with all of you yeah and you could you're, you guys are now still saying controlling and stopping and all this what i'm saying is that the business doesn't want to hear you say we're controlling the business with our risk management process they want to hear that you're part of the, the picture to say you help us innovate you help us grow in a controlled way as a business and we can control we can grow then forever you know and we we can innovate forever because we've got the right right processes behind us underneath that risk management has built so if that doesn't resonate quite yet i don't see too many people commenting on the validity of this uh, of this slide um but i really hope you understand the difference here yeah the words controlling stopping slowing down you know it doesn't actually uh, resonate well with boards executives and innovators in the business and they're the, they're the people that you want to bring along to your journey right so that's a way to to maybe describe it so how do you do that? Okay, so setting the right risk appetite and risk capacity from the top down in a workshop, for example, this is the sort of thing that I do. I get people who are on a board involved, executive, get them involved, hands on, sometimes with sticky notes uh, or something like that, colorful boards, you know, where they have to articulate what is the risk appetite and the risk capacity for each of our types of risks. Yeah, and I want them to be really specific and measurable. And that I can then take to the next level down to the middle management, to the operational staff to say, this is what we actually allow. This is what we think is okay in terms of risk. And this is the level that we want. You know, there's a difference. There's two different levels there. The one is the stretch level. And then we have a level where we go, this is very comfortable. And so we'd like people to actually, uh, yeah, to, to, to think about it that way, you know, in terms of capacity and appetite. And somewhat further de to detail on that, this is the real magic, by the way. And I actually, um, I'm not allowed to, slide, to, to share the whole slide deck. I believe I'll, I'll check in with, uh, with that. But um, if you, maybe um, it might be the better way to actually get in touch through MT Renla or through the organization, you know, to uh, th that host the webinar here. So, or to direct, directly contact me on LinkedIn and to ask for some of those screenshots that you found interesting so that I can at least see where the, uh, the, the information is shared because uh, this, this is really high, high valuable information that we normally do as consulting sort of, sort of work. So strategic risks, you can see their risk capacity and risk appetite. I'll highlight one or two examples here. One is, for example, risk capacity, meaning we want less than three new competitors entering the market. I mean, that is really our risk capacity. If there's more competitors entering, we really have a problem to survive. That's just an example, right? For your industry, it might be five, or for your business, it might be 20, you know, competitors. This is just example, you know, values, of course. But the, the, the wording of it is what I'm interested in here. So less than three is uh, less or, or, or three is, then is, is the uh, risk capacity. Then maybe your risk appetite is only one entering the market. That's your risk appetite. You really don't want more than that. If it's a positive threat, an opportunity, an innovation, for example, we might say the risk capacity is that we have at least one innovation per year, no less than that, because that will make us stagnant and slow. Whereas risk appetite is really that we introduce three new uh, product innovation uh, per product innovations per annum. So this is the way you can describe risk capacity and risk appetite, and you can also combine certain statements. Like for example, the last one, less or less than one unsuccessful merger or acquisition resulting in less than 10% overall profit loss in the same year. The risk capacity could be that kind of statement, yeah, that we have less than one unsuccessful merger. And that if it happens, it results in less than 10% profit loss in that year. Yeah, because we're of course trying to grow the profit, right? 
Now, the risk appetite in that same context could be that we really want to successful mergers and acquisitions, not unsuccessful ones. We want successful ones and, and we want two or more. And we want to generate more than 15% overall profit increase by the end of year two. So does that make sense? It's like how to word things, make it really practical, tangible, and let the staff then work with these particular thresholds and go, aha, this is what, ah, if I scored, if, if, sorry, if we have um, two successful mergers acquisition, but only maybe 10% of a profit increase, we're not quite there yet. We're in the yellow zone. You know, we're between the risk appetite and the risk capacity, but we're getting there. Yeah. Another category and with a bunch of examples is the financial risk category. And you can see here, I'll highlight one example here, which is, for example, no more than 10% price increases across all raw materials that we purchase. And ideally, the risk appetite is 10% discount negotiated across all materials per purchased. So instead of saying we have a uh, negative one, and then it has to be measured an, against another negative one, we now have a negative and a positive actually that we're measuring against each other in that same contest, context. Another example here is um, we don't want more than 20% staff turnover per year across technically skilled staff. Risk appetite might be 5%. In terms of the positive risk, you know, 97% uptime of our primary system. On the risk appetite, we might say 99.8% uptime of our systems. In terms of uh, getting spare parts delivered by our three main vendors, we might say we don't want more than two days delay, basically, in what they've promised us in terms of delivery. We don't, well, on the, on, the, on the risk appetite side, we actually want them to be always one day earlier than agreed. That's our risk appetite. So it's not just sitting on the deadline, but it comes earlier. So again, we've been now combining the positive and the negative. And then the final example that I'll highlight here on the compliance risk side of things, it might be the number of warnings that you get by regulators about your compliance. You don't want more than four potentially, but ideally you want to have two positive independent mentions in national media. So now we're comparing a negative with how many positives do you want? Yeah, it's just a different way to map it out. And then the last example there I'll uh, show, which is the, the one at the bottom, Maybe your risk, risk capacity is that you don't have more than three workplace health and safety court cases per annum with an estimated 30% uh, cost of your operating budget in terms of legal costs. On the right-hand side, the appetite is no more than one court case per annum and really only 5% of your operating budget in terms of legal costs. So that's probably the, the most important part I wanted to share here that you can map it out that way. Now, this seems like a really hard journey, right? Um, how to monitor and improve slowly, steadily, of course, monitoring your risks and detecting and assessing emerging risks. Also adjusting and improving your agreed risk appetite and risk capacity levels. So I'm talking about the previous slide here. Those levels you have to adjust every year as well. Monitoring, testing, validating and improving your risk controls, for example, your treatments and improving your overall risk management approach, your framework, your process, your documentation. So there are other things that you want to monitor and improve. So we're talking about individual risks, the overall framework, you know, your actual treatment options, and also your agreed appetite and capacity levels. All of those need to be monitored and, and improved over time. Okay, the final one is then showing that context of continual improvement, plan, do, check, act is something fairly familiar with everybody, I think. Um, so we're trying to always improve over time our risk management process, and we actually try to feed information from our interested parties, from external parties, and also feed back to them how we've over time, how we have improved our risk management. So those are the, the final thoughts here. Um, I hope you enjoyed what I had to share here today.